This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Warlords of Mars Written by Edgar Rice Burroughs and read by J. D. Weber on the south shores of Lake Superior. Chapter 9 With the Yellow Men Thuvan Din was not long in joining me, and though we found the hooked weapon a strange and savage thing with which to deal, the three of us soon dispatched the five black-bearded warriors who opposed us. When the battle was over, our new acquaintance turned to me, and removing the shield from his wrist, held it out. I did not know the significance of his act, but judged that it was but a form of expressing his gratitude to me. I afterward learned that it symbolized the offering of a man's life in return for some great favor done him, and my act of refusing, which I had immediately done, was what was expected of me. Then except from Taulu, Prince of Marantina, said the yellow man, this token of my gratitude, and reaching beneath one of his wide sleeves he withdrew a bracelet and placed it upon my arm. He then went through the same ceremony with Thuvan Din. Next he asked our names, and from what land we hailed. He seemed quite familiar with the geography of the outer world, and when I said I was from Helium he raised his eyebrows. Ah, he said, you seek your ruler and his company. Know you of them, I asked? But little more than that they were captured by my uncle, Salensis Ol, Jeddak of Jeddaks, ruler of Okar, land of the yellow men of Barsoom. As to their fate I know nothing, for I am at war with my uncle, who would crush my power in the principality of Marantina. These from whom you have just saved me are warriors he has sent out to find and slay me, for they know that often I come alone to hunt and kill the sacred app which Salensis Ol so much reveres. It is partly because I hate his religion that Salensis Ol hates me, but mostly does he fear my growing power and the great faction which has arisen throughout Okar that would be glad to see me ruler of Okar and Jeddak of Jeddaks in his place. He is a cruel and tyrannous master whom all hate, and were it not for the great fear they have of him, I could raise an army overnight that would wipe out the few that might remain loyal to him. My own people are faithful to me, and the little valley of Marantina has paid no tribute to the court of Salensis Ol for a year. Nor can he force us, for a dozen men may hold the narrow way to Marantina against a million. But now, as to thine own affairs, how may I aid you? My palace is at your disposal, if you wish to honor me by coming to Marantina. When our work is done, we shall be glad to accept your invitation, I replied. But now you can assist us most by directing us to the court of Salensis Ol and suggesting some means by which we may gain admission to the city and the palace, or whatever other place we find our friends to be confined. Talul gazed ruefully at our smooth faces and at Thuvan Din's red skin and my white one. First you must come to Marantina, he said, for a great change must be wrought in your appearance before you can hope to enter any city in Okar. You must have yellow faces and black beards, and your apparel and trappings must be those least likely to arouse suspicion. In my palace is one who can make you appear as truly yellow men as does Salensis Ol himself. His counsel seemed wise, and as there was apparently no other way to ensure a successful entry to Cadabra, the capital city of Okar, we set out with Taulu, Prince of Marantina, for his little rock-bound country. The way was over some of the worst traveling I have ever seen, and I do not wonder that in this land where there are neither thoats nor flyers that Marantina is in little fear of invasion. But at last we reached our destination, the first view of which I had from a slight elevation a half mile from the city. Nestled in a deep valley lay a city of Martian concrete, whose every street and plaza and open space was roofed with glass. All about lay snow and ice but there was none upon the rounded, dome-like crystal covering that enveloped the whole city. Then I saw how these people combated the rigors of the Arctic, and lived in luxury and comfort in the midst of a land of perpetual ice. Their cities were veritable hothouses, and when I had come within this one, my respect and admiration for the scientific and engineering skill of this buried nation was unabounded. The moment we entered the city, Taulul threw off his outer garments of fur, as did we, and I saw that his apparel differed but little from that of the red races of Barsoom. 
except for his leathern harness covered thick with jewels and metal he was naked nor could one have comfortably worn apparel in that warm and humid atmosphere for three days we remained the guests of prince talu during that time he showered upon us every attention and courtesy within his power he showed us all that was of interest in his great city the marantina atmosphere plant will maintain life indefinitely in the cities of the north pole after all life upon the balance of dying mars is extinct through the failure of the air supply should the great central plant again cease functioning as it did upon that memorable occasion that gave me the opportunity of restoring life and happiness to the strange world that i had already learned to love so well he showed us the heating system that stores the sun's rays in great reservoirs beneath the city and how little is necessary to maintain the perpetual summer heat of the glorious garden spot within this arctic paradise broad avenues of sod sown with the seed of the ochre vegetation of the dead sea bottoms carried the noiseless traffic of light and airy ground flyers that are the only form of artificial transportation used north of the gigantic ice barrier the broad tires of these unique flyers are but rubber-like gas bags filled with the eighth barsoomium ray or ray of propulsion that remarkable discovery of the martians that has made possible the great fleets of mighty airships that render the red men of the outer world supreme it is this ray which propels the inherent or reflected light of the planet off into space and when confined gives to the martian craft their airy buoyancy the ground flyers of marantina contain just sufficient buoyancy in their automobile-like wheels to give the cars traction for steering purposes and though the hind wheels are geared to the engine and aid in driving the machine the bulk of this work is carried by a small propeller at the stern i know of no more delightful sensation than that of riding in one of these luxuriously appointed cars which skim light and airy as feathers along the soft mossy avenues of marantina they move with absolute noiselessness between borders of crimson sword and beneath arching trees gorgeous with the wondrous blooms that mark so many of the highly cultivated varieties of barsoomium vegetation by the end of the third day the court barber i can think of no other earthly appellation by which to describe him had wrought so remarkable a transformation in both thuvandin and myself that our own wives would never have known us our skins were of the same lemon color as his own and great black beards and mustaches had been deftly affixed to our smooth faces the trappings of warriors of okar aided in the deception and for where beyond the hothouse cities we each had suits of black and yellow striped orlick taulul gave us careful directions for the journey to cadabra the capital city of the okar nation which is the racial name of the yellow men this good friend even accompanied us part way and then promising to aid us in any way that he found possible bade us adieu on parting he slipped upon my finger a curiously wrought ring set with a dead black lustreless stone which appeared more like a bit of bituminous coal than the priceless barsoomium gem which in reality it is there had been but three others cut from the mother stone he said which is in my possession these three are worn by nobles high in my confidence all of whom have been sent on secret missions to the court of salensis ol should you come within fifty feet of any of these three you will feel a rapid pricking sensation in the finger upon which you wear this ring he who wears one of its mates will experience the same feeling it is caused by an electrical action that takes place the moment two of these gems cut from the same mother stone come within the radius of each other's power by it you will know that a friend is at hand upon whom you may depend for assistance in time of need should another wearer of one of these gems call upon you for aid do not deny him and should death threaten you swallow the ring rather than let it fall into the hands of enemies guard it with your life john carter for some day it may mean more than life to you with this parting admonition our good friend turned back toward marantina and we set our faces in the direction of the city of cadabra and the court of salensis ol jeddak of jeddaks that very evening we came within sight of the walled and glass-roofed city of cadabra it lies in a low depression near the pole surrounded by rocky snow-clad hills from the pass through which we entered the valley 
we had a splendid view of this great city of the north. Its crystal dome sparkled in the brilliant sunlight gleaming above the frost-covered outer wall that circles the entire one hundred miles of its circumference. At regular intervals great gates give entrance to the city, but even at the distance from which we looked upon the massive pile we could see that all were closed, and in accordance with Talul's suggestion we deferred attempting to enter the city until the following morning. As he had said, we found numerous caves in the hillsides about us, and into one of these we crept for the night. Our warm oluk skins kept us perfectly comfortable and it was only after a most refreshing sleep that we awoke shortly after daylight on the following morning. Already the city was astir, and from several of the gates we saw parties of yellow men emerging, following closely each detail of the instruction given us by our good friend of Marantina, we remained concealed for several hours until one party of some half-dozen warriors had passed along the trail below our hiding-place and entered the hills by way of the pass along which we had come the previous evening. After giving them time to get well out of sight of our cave, Thuvan Din and I crept out and followed them, overtaking them when they were well into the hills. When we had come almost to them I called aloud to their leader. When the whole party halted and turned toward us, the crucial test had come. Could we but deceive these men, the rest would be comparatively easy. Kaor, I cried as I came closer to them. Kaor, responded the officer in charge of the party. We be from Ilal, I continued, giving the name of the most remote city of Okar, which has little or no intercourse with Kerabra. Only yesterday we arrived, and this morning the captain of the gate told us that you were setting out to hunt orlucks, which is a sport we do not find in our own neighborhood. We have hastened after you to pray that you allow us to accompany you. The officer was entirely deceived, and graciously permitted us to go with them for the day. The chance guess that they were bound upon an orlock hunt proved correct, and Talul had said that the chances were ten to one that such would be the mission of any party leaving Cadabra by the pass through which we entered the valley, since that way leads directly to the vast plains frequented by this elephantine beast of prey. In so far as the hunt was concerned, the day was a failure, for we did not see a single orlock. But this proved more than fortunate for us, since the yellow men were so chagrined by their misfortune that they would not enter the city by the same gate by which they had left it in the morning, as it seemed that they had made great boast to the captain of that gate about their skill at this dangerous sport. We therefore approached Carabra at a point several miles from that at which the party had quitted it in the morning, and so were relieved of the danger of embarrassing questions and explanations on the part of the gate captain, whom we had said had directed us to this particular hunting party. We had come quite close to the city when my attention was attracted toward a tall, black shaft that reared its head several hundred feet into the air from what appeared to be a tangled mass of junk or wreckage, now partially snow-covered. I did not dare venture an inquiry for fear of arousing suspicion by evident ignorance of something which as a yellow man I should have known, but before we reached the city gate I was to learn the purpose for that grim shaft and the meaning of the mighty accumulation beneath it. We had come almost to the gate when one of the party called to his fellows, at the same time pointing toward the distant southern horizon. Following the direction he indicated, my eyes descried the hull of a large flyer approaching rapidly from above the crest of the encircling hills. Still other fools who would solve the mysteries of the forbidden north, said the officer, half to himself. Will they never cease their fatal curiosity? Let us hope not, answered one of the warriors, for then what should we do for slaves and sport? True, but what stupid beasts they are to continue to come to a region from whence none of them ever has returned. Let us tarry and watch the end of this one, suggested one of the men. The officer looked toward the city. The watch has seen him, he said. We may remain, for we may be needed. I looked toward the city and saw several hundred warriors issuing from the nearest gate. They moved leisurely, as though there were no need for haste, nor was there, as I was presently to learn. Then I turned my eyes once more toward the flyer. She was moving rapidly toward the city and when she had come close enough I was surprised to see that her propellers were idle. Straight for that grim shaft she bore. 
At the last minute I saw the great blades move to reverse her, yet on she came as though drawn by some mighty irresistible power. Intense excitement prevailed upon her deck, where men were running hither and thither, manning the guns and preparing to launch the small one-man flyers, a fleet of which is part of the equipment of every Martian war vessel. Closer and closer to the black shaft the ship sped. In another instant she must strike, and then I saw the familiar signal flown that sends the lesser boats in a great flock from the deck of the mother ship. Instantly a hundred tiny flyers rose from her deck, like a swarm of huge dragonflies, but scarcely were they clear of the battleship than the nose of each turned toward the shaft, and they too rushed on a frightful speed toward the same, now seemingly inevitable end that menaced the larger vessel. A moment later the collision came. Men were hurled in every direction from the ship's deck, while she, bent and crumpled, took the last long plunge to the scrap heap at the shaft's base. With her fell a shower of her own tiny flyers, for each of them had come in violent collision with the solid shaft. I noticed that the wrecked flyers scraped down the shaft's side, and that their fall was not as rapid as might have been expected, and then suddenly the secret of the shaft burst upon me, and with it an explanation of the cause that prevented a flyer that passed too far across the ice barrier ever returning. The shaft was a mighty magnet, and when once a vessel came within the radius of its powerful attraction for the aluminum steel that enters so largely into the construction of all barsoomium craft, no power on earth could prevent such an end as we had just witnessed. I afterward learned that the shaft rests directly over the magnetic pole of Mars, but whether this aids in any way to its incalculable power of attraction I do not know. I am a fighting man, not a scientist. Here, at last, was an explanation of the long absence of Tardos Morse and Morse Kajak. These valiant and intrepid warriors had dared the mysteries and dangers of the frozen north to search for Cathoris, whose long absence had bowed in grief the head of his beautiful mother, Dejah Thoris, Princess of Helium. The moment that the last of the flyers came to rest at the base of the shaft, the black-bearded yellow warriors swarmed over the mass of wreckage upon which they lay, making prisoners of those who were uninjured and occasionally dispatching with a sword thrust one of the wounded who seemed prone to resent their taunts and insults. A few of the uninjured red men battled bravely against their cruel foes, but for the most part they seemed too overwhelmed by the horror of the catastrophe that had befallen them to do more than submit sublimely to the golden change with which they were manacled. When the last of the prisoners had been confined, the party returned to the city, at the gate of which we met a pack of fierce gold-collared apps, each of which marched between two warriors, who held them with strong chains of the same metal as their collars. Just beyond the gate, the attendants loosened the whole terrible herd, and as they bounded off toward the grim black shaft, I did not need to ask to know their mission. Had there not been those within the cruel city of Cadabra who needed succour far worse than the poor unfortunate dead and dying out there in the cold upon the bent and broken carcasses of a thousand flyers, I could not have restrained my desire to hasten back and do battle with those horrid creatures that had been dispatched to rent and devour them. As it was, I could but follow the yellow warriors with bowed head, and give thanks for the chance that had given Thuvan Din and me such easy ingress to the capital of Salensis Ol. Once within the gates we had no difficulty in eluding our friends of the morning, and presently found ourselves in a Martian hostelry. End of chapter 9